Welcome back guys. A few days ago I posted a video of the fossilized palm root cuff in a time lapse type format and I had someone ask me to actually uh, do some commentary on how I created it. So I am slowing it down and stepping you through my process. Hopefully you enjoy and if not just go watch the shorter version if uh, listening to my voice is just not your thing. So when I start a piece, um, I like to start with the stone, of course, kind of dictates the direction that the piece goes in. And this is a beautiful fossilized palm root or petrified palm root. And I'm actually making this for a friend and she specified that she wanted this turned into a cuff. So I also have a 20 gauge sterling silver back plate. And I have a list in the description of all the materials that I used, and I included links. There's also the, the tools that I use as well. But uh, there's not a whole lot of materials that goes into this, because it's quite a dainty cuff, even though there's quite a large stone. The bezel that I use is a 3 16 inch uh, by it's a 24 gauge bezel. I usually use 1 8 inch a lot, but this stone is a little a little high for a 1 8 inch. So I went with just a little bit taller and you'll see that I trimmed that down later in the video to make it fit. You can also lift the stone if you need to. And the cuff itself is a 12 gauge round wire and that is sterling silver as well but what I do with that round wire is I texture it using a texture plate that I get from Oregon Trail Silver Let's start by making the bezel cup. And with the 24 gauge, it's a little thicker. It's not quite as easy to manipulate, but it's still fine silver, so it's not too bad. I start out by squaring off the end of the wire. And you wanna make it as straight as you can. And just a few passes here should get it squared right up. And once that wire is nice and square, nice and flat, then we can wrap it around the stone and get our shape. And again, because this wire is heavier, a typical bezel wire is 28 gauge. I recently started working with a thicker gauge just because I like the look of it. It is a little more challenging though, so if you're just getting started out, I recommend that you start with the 28 gauge bezel wire. Once I have it wrapped around the stone and it's fitting snugly, I want to place a mark where the piece overlaps so that I know where to cut it. Most often I just use a scribe to do this because I can get a really fine line. If it's difficult for you to see, you can just use a, a marker or something that will be a little easier for you to, to see when you go to cut your line. I have a pair of snips that I like to use and one side cuts flat and one side leaves uh, a bit of a, an edge to it. So with the flat side inward, I will just cut the end. And this is just kind of a, you have to just play around with it to see if it fits. Once I cut that, there's always a little edge to it. So I knock off that edge, make sure it's nice and square with my file. And the file that I'm using here is just a flat file. This particular file I think is a 
a number four cut, so it's pretty rough. But uh, I go back in, check the fit. This one happens to be overlapping a bit still. So I just continue this nipping a little off at a time because I don't want it too short. If it's too long, I can adjust as necessary. So I just snipped a little bit more off and go back in with my file and file that down. And then I will test the fit again. So that's a much better fit. Now I need to line up the ends in preparation for solder. And I'm just passing the ends over each other to build up some tension because I want this to stay closed when I solder it. I want to make sure that everything is aligned. You don't want uh, a step up or anything like that. And I like to use my parallel pliers or some flat nose pliers to help kind of squeeze those together a little bit to get everything straight and aligned. So you can spend a bit of time doing this, but this is an important step. You don't want it to be crooked in any way. You want that perfectly aligned. You don't want to see any gaps because solder won't fill gaps. You want it to be touching and that's a really good join there. So I should be able to successfully solder that. Now we'll take it over to the soldering station and I use handy flux and flux that solder uh, or that seam where I want to solder the piece together. Since this is my first soldering operation, I like to use hard solder. So there's different levels of solder and you want to start with hard and then you can go to medium and then easy. So this is my first one. I'm going to use hard. I like to clean off the solder with a Scotch-Brite pad just to make sure there's nothing on it. Nice and clean and that's going to allow the solder to flow more easily. So I just cut a few snippets off and just put them on the charcoal block and I'll place one of those directly on the seam. So this is one method of soldering. There's quite a few and I believe that I do go through different types of, of soldering. So I just have a acetylene air torch. I think I'm using a zero tip. And you see that I have my soldering pick in my right hand and my torch in my left hand, and I am right-handed. So you should learn to kind of control your torch with your left hand, and your soldering pick will allow you to move things around if they get displaced or help spread out the solder as it flows, which I'm doing here. So I'm heating up the piece. It's hard to tell from here. I'm kind of heating it from below and then I brushed it over the top to melt the solder. So the solder has melted. There's still a glob there on top. We will take care of that later. But now I'm just going to quench the piece in water and then pickle it. And I do have my pickling recipe in the in the comments, uh, in the description of the video. So I'm just spending a bit of time filing away the extra solder. You want to be careful not to actually file the bezel itself any more than necessary. You don't want to thin it out. You just want to get rid of the solder itself. And if we don't get rid of it all here, it's not a big deal. We're going to be soldering more and it will actually move that solder around a bit. But during the finishing work, we really will take care of any additional solder that we didn't. You definitely want to make sure that you get rid of anything that's on the inside that could affect it from properly sitting around that stone. So I have a nice fit. 
So I'm just checking to see how well it fits. And you can see when I turn it there, it has excess material on top. We'll take care of that as well. You want to make sure that the bezel fits nicely onto the back plate. You don't want any gaps or anything like that. So take a bit of time to get some sandpaper and sand down the bottom to make sure that it's nice and flat. And I like to go and kind of figure eight pattern to, to make sure that it's kind of evenly sanding down that back plate or sanding down that bezel. So I'm just checking against the back plate. The back plate is nice and flat, so we shouldn't have a problem. And I'm just rechecking the fit around the stone. And I have a, a tool that I use for leather working. It's a little wooden tool. You can pick up, you know, use anything that's going to give you some leverage. But I just usually will help smooth that bezel around the stone. And you may not need to do that. Now I'm taking my scribe and I know that this bezel is too high. So from the inside, I'm just running it around the top of the stone, marking the inside of that bezel. It's going to give me an indicator of where I need to trim that bezel down. And because this is a thicker bezel, it's really pretty easy to trim without deforming the metal. But if you have a stone that dips on the ends, which this one does slightly, then this is a really easy way to get that exact contour of the stone. And I'm just marking the back of the stone um, where the solder joint is. If these aren't cali you know, uh, this is a freeform uh, stone. Um, so, well, I, it's not really freeform, it's oval, right? But it's not exactly the same on both sides. So once I get it soldered, it may not fit as well in one direction as it does the other. So I just mark the back. Now that I have it all marked, I've got it marked inside where I need to trim it. I am ready to solder that bezel to the back plate. But first I just want to clean off that back plate. I use a green scotch bright pad, just rough it up a bit just to get rid of any oils or dirt, debris to make sure that it's nice and clean for my soldering operation. We are back at the soldering station and I'm just putting some handy flux on the back side of the bezel. Now remember I marked this bezel so make sure you're soldering the right side of the bezel to the back plate. So I've put handy flux on the bezel. Now I'm going to put it on the back plate itself. And I know that this is nice and clean because it's um, the handy flux is going on nicely. Just work on getting everything aligned. And you notice I only have enough silver to support that bezel. I'm not putting any extra things around the back plate. If you are, then you want to keep that in mind and, and allow for extra material. Now that this is our second soldering operation, our bezel, we used hard solder. So I'm going to use medium solder this time. And again, I'm cleaning up that solder. And you want to use just enough solder to get it all soldered in place. You don't want to go overboard. I think I used about eight pieces for this. Is you know it's a good size piece, so I definitely want enough solder to flow around. And I'm putting it in the inside of that bezel, and you can put it on the outside. It's just easier to put it on the inside. I think that's pretty common practice. And I'm just pushing those little pallions up against the side. Now this particular solder is wire solder and I flattened it using my goldsmith hammer so that the pieces don't roll around. But I like the wire solder. 
Some people buy the little pallions. Others buy it in sheep form and cut it themselves. It's just personal preference what you are used to using or care to use. So now I've placed all of my solder pallions evenly around the inside of that bezel. And I'm going to go back to my acetylene air torch. And I think I might have a little bit bigger tip on this one uh, because it's a little bit bigger piece, but I can't remember which one I'm using. But you'll notice I'm going around the outside of the piece and directing the flame mostly to the outside. I'll dip into the inside and bring it back to the outside. The key here is you want to keep that flame moving. If you don't, you risk melting your bezel. You're just gently coaxing that flame around and you don't want to go in too close because you also risk melting it. And you're looking for that flux to kind of glass over. It'll change colors. And you'll start to see the pallions start to melt. And at that point, I'll kind of bring the flame around to the outside and kind of chase it around. You can actually pull the solder around with the heat because it will follow the heat. And then I kind of go inside with my solder pick and just make sure that everything has flowed correctly. And I'll just give it a moment and then I'll quench it and pickle it. And clean it all up. Now that we have the piece out of the pickle and dried off, rinsed off and dried off, I'm just using a pair of shears to then carefully trim along that line that I scribed earlier. This is again a 24 gauge, so it doesn't really deform the metal when I do this. So if you're trying this on say a 28 gauge, you do have to be careful. It can kind of deform that metal a bit, but you can do it. I, I've done it. Um, you can also lift the stone with maybe some plastic uh, gift cards that are left over. I've done that before. People use all kinds of things to, to lift stones. So whatever your preferred preference is. If it's a nice hefty stone, this is what I prefer to do. If it's a really shallow stone, then I will lift it. But I like this method because I can get the exact contour of the stone. So I'm just carefully cutting away. Sorry for the out of focus uh, <laughs> portions. Once I have that cut away, then I use my flat file. And this file is, uh, I believe, a number two. I talked about this file earlier and I said it was a number four. It's actually a number two. So I just go around and clean off any of the burrs that were left behind from the scissors, smooth it all out, try to get it down to the line that I scribed. Once I'm happy with the overall general shape, I'll switch over to my number four ring file. I don't have a number four flat file, which is next on my list of things to get. Uh, this just gives it a smoother finish. So I just kind of smooth it out and then I'll go to my sanding sticks. I have a 400 grit and a 1000 grit. And I'll start with the 400 and then I'll go down to the 1000 and that just helps smooth everything out and gives it a nice finish. Once I have the bezel all shaped like I want it, then I like to go and clean up the inside of the bezel where I soldered it to the back plate. And here I'm just using an engraving tool. 
Um, I don't do any engraving. I have a few tools and I just haven't tried it out yet, but this is a knife graver and it really makes a great tool for just going in and cleaning out the inside. Now you want to trim away the back plate and you can do this with a saw and this is a 20 gauge so it's it's kind of thick but this is probably the thickest you'd want to even try to trim away with a pair of shears and just in the interest of saving time I just kind of nipped away at it with the shears to get rid of the excess back plate and you don't want to cut too close to the bezel because you can actually cut into it but I just carefully go around and I take away those corners first to help me kind of get in you don't want to just go in with a single uh, pass typically but because uh, you can also deform the metal not so much on a 20 gauge but if you're trying this method on a thinner gauge you can actually bend the metal and your back plate will no longer be nice and straight so just be careful just keep that in mind so I just work on this a bit to trim away any excess material and it won't be perfect I'll have to come back in here with my files and clean it up but I was being lazy that day and just didn't want to saw it So now that I've got all the excess material away from the bezel, I just take my number two flat file, pretty aggressive file, and do a little bit of hand filing to kind of even out that back plate around the bezel because it'll be pretty rough after taking the shears to it. And this can be pretty time consuming. If you have a little belt sander you could make quick work of this uh, or any other kind of um, sanding tools for maybe for your flex shaft I do still do a lot of hand work so it's just personal preference and what you want to do I do own a dual tool which it is a luxury item but I find that I use it a lot in my studio so for me it was well worth the investment but here I'm using a Scotch-Brite attachment and it's a see-through attachment so you can see what you're working on which is really great that's one of the things that I like about this tool the most but what this particular attachment does is it smooths out the metal it will remove some metal but it kind of moves it and it just smooths it out so it's one of my favorite attachments and after I've finished up the hand filing to get it in the general shape that I like then I come in here and smooth it all out and it really will smooth out a bezel quite nicely so I just spend some time smoothing out the edges making sure that that back plate is even with the bezel because I kind of want it to disappear and you can see here that I still have some excess solder on that bezel and using this tool I can gently work that excess solder away and you won't even see it after I'm done your pieces can heat up a bit when you're using this tool so you may need to wear some kind of finger protection uh, it depends on the size of the piece. The smaller the piece, the hotter it can get. Once I have the bezel where I want it, then I take it to the edge of the bezel, the top edge, and I slightly put an angle on it. It smooths it over quite nicely. It thins it out just a bit, and it leaves a really nice finish on it and then I'll flip it over to the back side and I'll kind of round those edges a little bit as well so that there are no sharp areas to the bezel cup and it's more comfortable to wear and then I will just take it and I'll just clean up the back a little bit this helps remove any scratches that may have been left from tools or files it just smooths it out quite nicely
My favorite part of this project was making the wire cuff itself. I just took some regular 12 gauge sterling silver round wire and decided that the piece needed a little something extra. So I have these gorgeous plates that I get from Oregon Trail Silver. And you can find them online. She has monthly sales, so they're uh, you know they're limited batch plates. So if you see something, you should grab it when it's available. But this particular design, her daughter designed, and it's called Lillian's Air. It's one of my favorite plates, actually. But put on wire, you don't really see the swirls so much, but it does give a very interesting texture. It almost looks like a wood grain texture. I'm just taking a little time to straighten out the wire as much as possible, and I like to use my parallel pliers to do that, but I need it as straight as possible, number one, for measuring appropriately, and I'm going to be using a rolling mill, so that will help when I put it through the rolling mill. So I start with six inches. It will stretch a little when I put it in the rolling mill, but then I'll trim it back down after I put it all together. So at this point, I had only cut out two pieces of wire. I did later add another piece, but I'm just annealing the wire before I put it through the rolling mill. Anytime you try to apply a texture to metal, you want to make sure that it is soft as possible and annealing is how you would accomplish this. So I've put a black Sharpie mark onto the wires and when that mark goes away, you know that your metal is properly annealed. You can also tell by the color of the metal as you're heating it whether it is getting to the right annealing temperature. You'll also notice there's like a ghosting that occurs. You can see it here as you're brushing the flame across. Either technique is fine to use, whatever you're most comfortable with. After I anneal, I just quench it and pickle it. And now I'm ready to take it over to the rolling mill. And this is a Durston rolling mill. It is a DRM F130. This one has a five to one gear ratio, which makes it really easy to use. And I'm just checking that I have the right tension on it. And I use a piece of craft foam on top and this really helps to push that metal down into the plate itself and it gives great impressions. So I keep checking the resistance here and I keep kind of dialing it in because I want the best impression possible. And with wire, you can really press it down pretty hard. So once I've got that, I just roll it through in a single pass. You don't want to pass this back through. And it will destroy the craft foam, but no biggie. Just throw that away. And you can see the nice impression that was left in the wire. Now that I have my three textured wires, I'm just going to trim off the ends and clean this up a bit. And I'm going to shape these to make that three wire cuff that I'm after. I will also check along the way to make sure that I have at least six inches of the straight wire and a little more than six inches of the two pieces that I will be bending. Once I have the ends trimmed, I'll measure it and determine the center of the wire. And I just want to leave a mark there on the center. And we'll come back and actually bend this piece into shape. And I need to do this for two of the three wires. I'm also trimming the second piece and I want it to match the first one in length.
And this is thicker wire, so I had to use some heavier duty wire cutters to actually cut through it. You can also use a jeweler saw. Now I need to shape two of the three wires, the two that I marked with the center point. And I'm just using a pair of ring bending pliers, they're called. And I just slightly pinch those in to kind of give it a wide V shape. And you don't want to do a lot because it actually will leave quite a bit of space just with that little bit that you bend. And so we see how that looks against the straight wire. And now we want to repeat that for the third wire so we can shape it for the other side. The trick here is getting them to be the same bend, the same angle. So you may have to work at it a little bit. And you see here I bent it a little more than I should have. So I'm just using my fingers to open that back up and now I need to tighten it just a little bit so I can use my pliers again and just bend it down a little more. So play around with this until you get them evenly bent. And this is how the three wires will go together to get that shape. Now that we have the shape that we want, we want to file the bottom edges to have a slight angle so that when the wire sits up against the flat wire, there's more of a contact space. And this will help when we go to solder these wires together because it'll give us more soldering area. Now that our wires are all shaped and filed, it is time to solder them together. And we just need to solder the end pieces together. I use a white soldering block. I think it's called a magnesia soldering block, but it's very soft. And it allows me to use T-pins to hold my pieces in place. And this is really helpful when you have these types of shapes to use these T-pins just for that little bit of holding power. So I'm positioning it in place using the T-pins, um, making sure that everything is lining up and I want to line it up on both ends to make it easier when I go to solder the other end as well. So you just take a little time get everything positioned just so, and then we can solder the pieces together. You'll notice that the textured side is actually down, face down. And the reason that I do this is when I put the solder on the back side, I don't want that solder to flow into the textured areas. So this just helps when I do the cleanup later clean it all up without having to worry about that soldering, that solder getting into the textured pieces kind of ruining the look. So here I'm actually using hard solder again because this is the first soldering operation on the cuff. I did use hard and medium on the bezel but there's not any other solder on this piece so I'm going to start with hard. And I'm just going to put two pieces of solder onto the piece here. And I'll actually cut a couple of extra snippets of solder then that I can add as well. And if I do that, then I'll use a pick soldering technique. So you'll be able to see that here.
But again, I'm just using my acetylene air torch. And I'm going to start by just slowly heating up the entire piece. And then once it's heated, I'll start to concentrate the flame there towards the end. And it'll go quickly. It'll solder pretty quickly. So because the wire is so thin, it doesn't take much. And when you see that solder flow, then you want to take that flame away so you don't melt your wire. So there it flowed. And now I'm just going to ball up those pieces and place them. And since it's already hot, it just immediately solders. I repeated the same process for the other side. Then I quenched it, pickled it, and now we're ready to shape the cuff. So I'm just trimming off the ends and I want it to be six inches in length in total. So I'll make sure I measure that and I'll just use my files and my buffing sticks to round off the edges, clean it up and get it ready to solder to the bezel cup. Now that we're ready to prepare the cuff to attach to the bezel cup, I'm going to use a soldering technique called sweat soldering. So I've already marked where I want my solder to be, and I had measured the bezel cup just to make sure that I don't flow outside of that area, and I'm only putting handy flux in that area and you can probably see my pencil marks there to give me an indicator of where that needs to be and we've already soldered this once we used hard solder so and I have hard and medium on the bezel cup and this is my last soldering operation so I'm going to use easy solder and that will flow very quickly and it'll be much easier to use and I shouldn't be melting any previous solder operations by using the easy solder. So I'm just cutting out six decently sized pieces. I'm going to put two pieces of solder on each wire and it will spread out and will allow me to easily attach it to the bezel cup. So I'm just going to take my soldering pick and your soldering pick should have some flux on it already. Or if it doesn't, you might want to put a little bit of flux on it, but I'm just heating up the wire cuff and then I'll individually ball up the solder and pick it up with the pick. So this is pick soldering here and I'll place it within the area on the cuff that I've put the handy flux and like I said I'm putting two on each wire and you'll see it started to melt the solder on that top wire already and after I get them all placed I'll just go back and I'll melt that all down and you see it kind of stays in the area where I had the handy flux so I will quench and pickle and then I'll bring the bezel cup in upside down and you'll see that I have marks on it as well and I'll just paint within those areas the handy flux because I don't want it to flow outside of those areas and that will help keep it contained. Now I'll place the pre-soldered wire cuff on top of the bezel plate. Make sure that you're your solder is face down. 
Take a bit of time to make sure that the placement is exactly where you want it. And my cuff was bent just a little, so I'm having to reshape it so that it lies flat. Because you want as much contact with the bezel plate as possible. So now that it's all placed, we already have our solder in place. We can now start to just heat up the piece and I'm just going to heat the whole cuff first, bring it up to temperature, and then I'll go in and focus right in that area that I want it to sweat solder. And you should be able to see a flash of silver underneath where those three wires are. And that's when you know that the silver, uh, the solder has uh, flowed. And a lot of times I'll use my soldering pick to kind of press down to make sure that it's getting a good join. So if you see an area that looks like it hasn't quite joined properly, just kind of go back in and press down on that to allow that solder to flow. Because you want good connection all the way across all three of those wires. And then I will quench it pickle it, and we can get ready to shape our cuff. Before I begin shaping, I like to use an ammonia solution. I have the recipe in the description. But I like to use this solution heated and just clean up that cuff really well. And I like to use a jeweler's brass brush to do this. And it gives a nice finish to it as well. But clean it really well and make sure that you get all that white um, coating that's left after you do, you know, after you have it in your pickle. And this will help you later when it comes time to polish your piece. You can use a variety of different tools to help you shape your cuff. You can use a bracelet mandrel. They make oval ones, and that's what I would recommend for a cuff. They make round ones, and those are best for bangles. Uh, there's different tools out there on the market that help you bend it more evenly than, say, banging on a mandrel. This particular set that I'm using is called a bangle forming die set and it has 10 different pieces with it with different shapes. This is the flat die, there's a concave and a convex shape die so you can get different shapes and I really like using this. I start out by using the larger flat die and doing the overall shaping and I just spend a bit of time, I'm careful around where the bezel itself is because I don't want to distort that in any way. I want to keep that flat. And I just work on the rest of the, the wire cuff to get it into shape. And I'm just using a nylon hammer here. So I don't want to mar my metal at all at this point. So these nylon hammers make it easy to do without leaving any kind of marks on your metal and they're pretty easy and cheap to get this particular one I think I got from Harbor Freight but um, you can get the if you're interested in the bangle forming die there's a number of places that you can find them um, they have them at places like Auto Fry. they have them on Amazon I believe Rio Grande may have them as well but I've had a lot of fun with them I find them quite easy to use, especially the the shaped ones where you can make a a uh, anti-clastic shaped cuff. And you'll have to do some adjusting with your hands, but I believe pretty much all of them work that way too. So once I've got the general shape, I change it out to the smaller die, and then I can come in and refine the you know last part of the cuff or the the end of the cuff to make the overall shape more of a C shape 
um, which is what you want for a cuff. Because my cuff has a texture, I want that texture to pop a little more than it does on just the shiny silver. So I like to add a patina. And one of my favorite products to use is uh, Midas Black Max, which is available from Rio Grande. I've used Liver of Sulfur in the past as well. I find this one is just easier to use. I don't have to heat it and I could just easily paint it in just the areas that I want. So I carefully just paint it on the top side of the wire. I don't really have a need to, to patina the bottom side or the bezel itself. So it saves me a lot of cleanup time if I just put it where I want it. So just take a little bit of time, paint it on the textured surface, and then we'll come back and we will remove that patina or remove it from the high spots of the cuff. Once we have all of the patina applied, we want to make sure that we rinse our piece and our paintbrush in a baking soda solution. And this will stop the patina from working anymore. It'll neutralize it. If you don't do this step later on, you can start to see some kind of gold coloring in your piece that you don't want. So make sure that you neutralize it in baking soda and then rinse it really well in water before you proceed to the next step. Now that our patina has been applied, we just want to go in with either a sanding stick or fine steel wool and remove as much or as little patina as we want. So whatever your preference is for your finished piece, you just want to work on that. Remove the patina from the highlights or the raised areas. You want the patina to stay in those recessed areas so that you can really see the details that you put in by texturing the piece. One thing to note, if you use still wool, which I do use quite often, you want to make sure that you rinse off or brush off all of the steel wool fragments that can get caught in your piece because when you put that in your pickle, it can then turn your pieces uh, a coppery color. Our next step is to set the stone. Because this is a heavier bezel, it's a little harder to push that bezel wire over, but the steps are the same. And I like to use a bezel pusher or a bezel rocker. There's different kinds that you can use. You can, I think there's some acrylic tools out there you can use as well. You can use uh, wooden chopsticks. So whatever your preference is, whatever you're used to using. So I start by just pushing in the um, bezel in alternating patterns. So I'll start at the ends and the sides and I just keep flipping it around and pushing in that bezel on opposite sides. And again this is thicker so it takes a little more effort. If this was a ring, it'd be easier because I could hold it in my vise, but uh, it's a little it's a little harder when it's a bracelet. So you want to make sure that you're holding it as securely as possible. You don't want that bezel rocker or bezel pusher to slip and across your stone because you can potentially scratch it. Depends on the most hardness of your stone, but be careful and just work your way around the piece little by little pushing that bezel against the stone and you want to check from time to time to make sure that your stone 
is secure in there. And then you can come back and then just roll it. If you're using a bezel rocker, you can just roll it across. You don't want to just start doing that right off the bat because you can really get the piece kind of messed up and um, it'll crimp on the ends. So that's why we work on opposite sides a little at a time. And I actually had to go back into this piece and use um, a little hammer with my bezel rocker just to really get it set against that stone because it was being pretty stubborn and that's just due to the thickness of the bezel. I don't show it here, but I like to go back in. I have this um, burnisher that I like to use and I burnish against the top of the bezel and it helps push it down. It helps um, create a, a nicer finish and it leaves a nice high polish on it as well. So you can use a variety of tools to get your stone set. And here I have a um, modified tool that I made that I can then just run around the top and it's kind of like a burnisher as well. It leaves a really nice finish. And then I go back in with my sanding sticks and clean up any marks that I may have left from the bezel pusher or the burnishing tool. Once the stone is set, I'm ready to polish the piece and I use silicone polishing wheels, especially around the bezel. And these are the Advantage from Rio Grande, but I think they rebranded them and they're called Eve now, but you can find them on Rio Grande searching for silicone polishing wheels. And this is a, this is the finest grade. So I'm just going around the bezel, polishing it up. It's easiest to get in with this particular type of polishing wheel. And I find that they do a really good job. And you want to make sure that you're wearing a mask of some sort because the silicone that's kicked up off these wheels can be really bad for your lungs. So be sure you're following safety guidelines when you use these. Once I have finished up with the wheels, the silicone wheels, I like to use a felt polishing wheel. This one is kind of um, a cone shaped and I use a polishing compound called ZAM. You can also find this at Rio Grande. I'm sure there's other places that carry it too, but it really leaves a, a nice shine on your pieces. So I just go in with this cone shaped wheel if you you can order a multitude of shapes and I provided a link in the description to these as well but you can get into tight spaces with the different shapes of wheels and it's real convenient to use these with your flex shaft if you have one if you don't have a, a bigger polishing wheel and even with the larger polishing wheels these smaller felt tip wheels make it a lot easier to to get into some um, more difficult spaces to get into. So I just take some time to polish up the piece and it will sometimes leave like a black residue on your piece and you'll need to clean that off. So don't be alarmed when you have black gunk all over your piece and your hands. It gets quite messy. Once I have finished polishing the bezel, then I like to switch over to my jewel tool. The attachment that I'm using here is an inside ring uh, felt wheel attachment, and it fits nicely on the jewel tool. It's not, an, it's not an attachment that is sold with the jewel tool, but you can find it for use with other buffers. And I just use the same polishing compound the ZAM polishing compound and I just take some time to carefully polish inside of the cuff itself. Mm -hmm. 
Once I have the inside and the edges polished, then I switch over to a polishing pad that you can get from Jewel Tool. And this one's nice because it has that see-through capability and it's a hard felt pad and you can use the Zam polishing compound with this as well. This is nice because it doesn't seem to take away too much of the patina that's inside of that texture. So I just use this to run along the outside over that textured wire to get that higher polish that I'm looking for. There is still one area of the cuff that I haven't polished yet. The inside ring polisher can't get into the inside of the back plate. So I'm switching back to the Advantage or Eve silicone polishing wheels. And I'm using a knife edge polishing wheel for this one so that I can really get in close to where those wires are soldered next to the back plate. And I just use this wheel to polish this up, take away any minor scratches that may remain. And this one is the finest polishing wheel, so you can use a, a coarser polishing wheel to start with to get out any scratches and then work your way through the different grades of polishing wheels. I just started with this one um, just because uh, I didn't have too many scratches in the piece. And then once I'm through with this knife edge polishing wheel, then I switch back to the cone-shaped um, felt wheel and finish the piece up with the Zam polishing compound. When you use these polishing compounds, it will leave a black residue on your piece. So once you're done with all of your polishing, then you want to clean the piece with the ammonia solution, uh, a warm ammonia solution and just a soft toothbrush, and then rinse it real well. And then this is our final piece. So if you enjoyed seeing these videos and you'd like to see more, then please be sure and like and subscribe. Thank you.